The Kadzukian Network presents Grindset, inside the mind of successful entrepreneurs with your host, Cynthia Daniels and William Sprack. I think sometimes we over plan things and that can kind of cause a delay or setback. But I would definitely say dive in, you know, get your name started, get your website up, get your business cards. But you're going to learn from a lot of amazing people uh, what kind of pitfalls that they have, the challenges, but what really made them successful, what made them keep going. Grind Set. Welcome back to another episode of Grind Set. I'm your host, Cynthia Daniels, Chief Event Strategist of Cynthia Daniels and Company. And I'm your co-host, Williams Brack, asset-based lender at First Tennessee Bank. And today's guest is Lauren Reedy. Uh, she's the owner and master of stories at Forever Ready Productions, LLC. Uh, what's really interesting, she's an Emmy Award winning storyteller. And she just decided to walk away from her journalism background and start her own production company. Well, I, I've seen her work. And she's been on the news, so I have really high expectations for this episode. We'll be right back with Lauren Reedy of Forever Ready Productions right here on Grind Set. Grind Set. As promised, we have Lauren Reedy in the studio with us today. How are you doing today, hey, Lauren. Lauren? Good to be here, y'all. <laughs> Lauren, we have so much ground to cover in a little bit of time, so I we're know. just going to jump right to it, okay? Dive right in. All right, so tell us a little bit about your company, Forever Ready Productions, LLC, and what exactly do you guys do? So we work primarily with nonprofits, small businesses, and startups here in Memphis to provide video content for them, mostly for social media, YouTube, Facebook, but also for events, fundraising efforts. Essentially, really, it's about telling your story and doing it at an accessible price point so that you don't blow your whole marketing budget on one (laughs) video campaign that lasts a month. Okay. Um, and so we make video accessible to folks who previously in the past haven't been able to do it. Okay. Um, and we're just growing significantly because there is a market for folks who need good quality video yeah. at an affordable price. Well, and I love that you said that you focus on nonprofits. I mean, there's so many businesses that could use your help. Why do you focus on just nonprofits? When I worked in news, I was in television for a decade and okay. in front of the camera. So now I'm behind it. It's so amazing. <laughs> That's why I have pink hair and wear my glasses and do whatever I want <laughs> the real uh, with my visuals these days. Mm-hmm. But uh, when I was in television, um, I started out because I wanted to be a voice for the voiceless, which sounds so cliche, but it was true. <laughs> You're passionate about I it. I really was passionate about telling stories and mm-hmm. empowering people through those stories. And as I started to advance in my career... As you all know, with the way social media is these days, it's all about click, 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 bait, yep. Yep. click bait, and you're covering the the crime tape and the all that stuff, and it, it got to be really draining. Okay. But what I was seeing in the city when I got to Memphis, this was my dream job to work in the city and then move on to a network. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm on a network right now, right? <laughs> right. We, we, we appreciate being check, honest about check, the journey. Right? <laughs> I wanted to go work for NBC and be on the Today Show, and I had Get people out. tell me that that was my talent and right. that I really had the the, the hunger right. um, and humility to do it. So I realized, though, I didn't want that because I didn't want to cover all that bad stuff. And I was mm. spotlighting nonprofits on the side for fun. Like yeah. I'd take oh, my wow. camera to an event and be like, I'm going to document this. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Okay. And then I would edit together in like a little recap music video thing. Yeah. Um, and it started to grow and nonprofits started saying, oh, I want Lauren to do that for me. And they started calling and asking if I would do it. And then I started going, I should probably charge for this. Wow. So it wasn't even planned. No, I mean, you're oh, just no. doing it. For, but you know, yeah. I hear that a lot with entrepreneurs and it started with me as well that you're doing this thing on the side for fun. And then you look up one day and people are watching you and they're like, well, I want to hire you right. to do the same thing. And what's also kind of fun about it mm-hmm. is that my husband and I, we got a GoPro for our wedding. It was a wedding gift. Okay. And I would uh, take, it made our life look epic. Which yeah. let's be honest, like <laughs> everybody's life is pretty <laughs> That, that's the purpose right. of a GoPro, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, and I'd get it. It was like, I got to do something epic because I have this camera. Yeah. But I would take all the epic things that we did in yeah. our first years of marriage and edit into what I called a ready mix okay. or a ready mix. Okay. And it was just like a year or a quarterly recap of the fun stuff we did. And I had a one of my cl- first clients say, I want one of those for my nonprofit. Now, wow. I don't I don't think of anchors or reporters as producers or editors, right? So what was your actual job when you worked in news? It was all kinds of things. Okay. I was a MMJ, which means multimedia journalist. Okay. okay. If you look up that hashtag, that's not what that means. <laughs> <laughs> MMJ, save that for later. Yeah, I'll let you all look that up on your own time. Okay. Uh, MMJ is multimedia journalist. Um, I was a BPJ, which sounds like a 
peanut butter and jelly sandwich, <laughs> uh, but it's a backpack journalist. <laughs> it's ah, the same thing. It's okay. just all your stuff's in your backpack, which is really just means you're the same. Okay. Um, I was so basically, I produce, edit, and write my own stuff on news. Every once in a while, I get paired with a photographer. Yep. Um, I was always going live. Um, sometimes I was running the live shot myself, mm-hmm. not with a selfie stick, although that would have been nice. <laughs> um, and it was just I did I did it all. Uh, I didn't get paid for three people's jobs, though, mm. if you're, you're curious. You're kidding. So, so you were the reporter on the side of the road with the tripod yep. and the camera. And just me. to the camera. With and like it was just you. In flats, because I learned very early in my <laughs> career that heels are a terrible idea. Okay. Um, and I was usually hair in a ponytail. And then right before I went live, you know, put it down. I right. became really good at doing my makeup in the car. Wow. Uh, not driving. Now, <laughs> okay. Were, were there like top up shots oh, so you tons, can have on yeah. sweatpants yeah. most of the time? I wish and, I could. <laughs> I, sweatpants, <laughs> yoga pants. Amazing. Uh, but really I had to, I had a lot of like um, capri slacks and stuff in the summer. Yeah. Can't wear shorts unless mm-hmm. it's like a story where you're going to jump in a pool, which wow. I did once. Um, but it was, you know, it was sort of like casual on the bottom, party on the top. Yeah. And I had to be professional looking at all times which was hard when you're doing it all. And yeah. for me, I'm more focused on the story. Yep. Right. I'm not focused on what I look like. So yeah. it was always an afterthought. Ah, it was you. almost as got if you. I was preparing to not do this. Now, that was the camera focused on you most of the time, right? Right. So how did it feel when you finally was able to turn the camera around and start working for yourself and capturing other people's stories with them as the center versus you telling the story? The immediate answer is amazing and relief. It was a relief, but it was also a little bit of an identity crisis. So mm. I was Lauren Squires on air. That's right. my maiden name. Right. That's That was my brand. You know, everybody pushes <laughs> your brand, your brand, your brand. And I had to really come to terms with like, that was kind of the end of Lauren Squires. Mm. Even though I still sign my emails, Lauren Squires. <laughs> um, and I had to really decide, okay, the whole reason you got into this wasn't for your brand. It was right. for it was to help tell stories. And once I accepted that and kind of moved forward with this is the new me and this yeah. is I really realized that that's what I was meant to do all along. That that TV was my medium at the time. Right. And me being on camera was the thing that gave me the credibility. I'm using, you know, air quotes here, but it was a tough switch. Right. Especially because it was my dream for so many Your years from, uh, the, from 16 on. Wow. I started working in television when I was 17. Wow. I ran cameras in the studio. Okay. I, so I've done every job in the newsroom. And then to say after a decade, I think I want to walk away from this. Yeah. That was like a real internal struggle. And I think that's something a lot of entrepreneurs face. Right. Um, when they're doing something that's fun on the side. Mm-hmm. It's a side hustle. That's how they all start. <laughs> You're lying if you didn't say it was Hashtag a side hustle. Hashtag side hustle. And, uh, you know, it starts as a side hustle and it starts to get realistic and you start to like it more than the job you have. And yeah. there's this struggle of, do I, do I take the leap or not? Um, and so I really had to come to terms with all of that. Right. And then I had to save money. Mm. I saved up six months of my salary before I said peace to the dream job. Well, I love that. And I was actually about to get into that. I, but you're listening to Grind Fed, powered by the Kazuki Network. I wanted to know, what was that breaking point for you? You're in the dream job. You have big aspirations. What made you say, you know what? I don't want this anymore. There were a lot of moments. But the one that I tell a lot, um, and, and it relates to a Memphis audience really well, is I was uh, volunteering at the Carpenter Art Garden in Binghampton. Okay. Love that place. Great organization. Great place. Yeah. Uh, magical things happening. And um, I got assigned another fight story. Okay, so you all know what I say when I say that. Like another, like <laughs> yeah. another story Typical. shot with vertical video of yeah. somebody fighting in a park or a yeah. cafeteria or something. And and to be totally candid and honest, it does not put um, the African American community in a positive spotlight. Right. And they were constantly assigning those stories to me. Yeah. Hmm. And I was like, y'all, I spend time in these communities. I have built relationships with everybody in this neighborhood, and I'm tired of representing something that's not true wow and i um i went up to there's a basketball court in binghampton it's grizzlies did it it's awesome yeah and i was up there and one of the kids who knows me from the garden said miss lauren how come you always do bad stories on our neighborhood Mm. wow (laughs) and i did not have an answer to explain to like an eight-year-old yeah except you know what you're right we should do more (laughs) and in that moment i got my cell phone out yeah and there was a basketball coach with a bunch of kids on the court um and i said you want to do a quick story with me on my phone Wow. And I put that together on Facebook that night before my deadline. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it, it like went viral. And I said, I got to stop doing 
this part of the news yeah. and do the thing that I love. Wow. There were a lot of moments like that and there were plenty of breaking points, but that one just like, it gives me goosebumps telling it because I didn't have an answer for that kid. And, and it's a good story. Too. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're listening to Grind Set right here on the Kazuki Network. We're with Lauren Reedy of Forever Reedy Productions and we'll be right back after the break. Grind Set on the Kazuki Network. Grind Set. Jazz, America's own original musical art form. When did it start? Who were and are some of the major players? How do you distinguish what kind of jazz you're listening to? We talk about the great and lesser known artists, songs and tunes, the instruments and the social impact jazz has had on world culture since its beginning at the start of the 20th century. Riffin on jazz on the Kazookian Network. Kazookian Grind Set. Welcome back to Grind Set. We're here with Lauren Reedy of Forever Ready Productions. And you did a great job of explaining your why. And it did fit, uh, fit into a, a really neat story. Now we want to talk about how the first year actually went. How else did you fund the first year business? Excellent question. So I should say we've been around for five years. We celebrated our five year anniversary in March, but I missed it. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. We were so busy that I forgot about it. (laughs) I marked it on the calendar so that I wouldn't forget. And then I forgot about it. And like a month later, I went, oh, we celebrated five years. (laughs) That's a real entrepreneur. (laughs) So uh, the first two years it was a side hustle. It was officially an LLC. Mm -hmm. I did not take a single dime of... um, profit everything stayed in the company and Mm -hmm. so the initial investment into the company was a gifted um camera that we got as a wedding gift so the gopro and then we also got a a, you know canon prosumer nice i would never use it now but i always tell people (laughs) start where you start you gotta start somewhere start where you start yeah and uh then everything we brought in just stayed in, in sort of like savings right okay um so that was really great but then when we started to get serious about my passion and where i wanted to head my husband was simultaneously um, getting his master's, his MBA mm-hmm. at CBU, right. and he took a business planning class. Mm. Wah, wah. Right. So yeah. I have a business minor, but that was like a decade ago. <laughs> Forever ago. I mean, and like those books probably are outdated. Yeah. They probably didn't talk about technology. <laughs> right. They're so old. So he was doing business planning and he said, can I use our company? And his professor was like, sweet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Most people make How stuff up. How cool is that? <laughs> so he used our company and he just made a business plan to replace my measly little TV salary. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he came to this, came to me with this presentation. <laughs> Do you think most spouses yeah. present things? No. <laughs> he came to me with this presentation and he said, you know, we could replace your salary. And if we paid you a certain hourly rate, you wouldn't, it doesn't cover 40 hours a week. Wow. And he said, do you think you could do that? And I said, I would work more than 40 hours a week. And he yeah. said, I know I'm just yeah, pointing it out. And so we looked at each other in that moment and we said, okay, the only way to know if this is going to work is go like full speed ahead. Yeah. yeah. For the next six months, I had six months left on my contract and TV. Okay. Good, and, great timing. Yeah. So very great timing. And, and for us, it was like, we had three jobs amongst the two of us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At the time I was working the morning show. So I'd get up at two in the morning Wow. and then I would pretend to look pretty on air. <laughs> it was like a hot mess express. <laughs> and then uh, I would, I would report in the morning show, put together a news story for the, for the noon show and then go work on the company mm-hmm. from one to nine Wow. and then take a little nap. And then when I co- if I couldn't shoot, my husband would go shoot. So we did all that for six months and said, all right, I'm, I'm quitting. So we saved up six months of a salary yep. so that I had six months of a runway. Yep. That first year solo was our third year in business, but first year full time. That's amazing. Yeah, that's what I want to hear about. Yeah, first yeah. year full first time, year, full-time. no job, yeah. right? So Going no job, one. like, oh my God, what did I do with my <laughs> life? Not really though, because um, I didn't have time to look up. Mm. Yeah. Um, our first year full time, I did six figures in revenue, not in profit and not paying myself. That's a huge difference. I always say that yeah. because it sounds yeah. really fancy. Yeah. But what I realized after those, it really wasn't even full. It was from March to December because mm-hmm. the first three years or three months I was still on uh, on the news. And I realized if I want to keep growing and I want to keep doing this and expanding this vision of positive stories and empowering other people, I can't do this alone or I'm going to burn out, which is also a real problem. In oh my entrepreneurship. God, I can so relate. And so you're <laughs> listening to Grind Set Powered by the Kazuki Network. I want to take back just about a, a minute because you're giving some real great advice to women that are listening, that are thinking about leaving their job, but they're not really sure how to do so. You talked about how you were able to do both jobs for six months and you talked about the timeline. You were up at 2 a.m. <laughs> for <did> work. <laughs> for work. And then you worked a full shift. And then from one to nine, you worked on your business. So 
I don't think a lot of women understand you can do both, but you have to have the drive and determination to do so. And you know what? I didn't have a kid then either. Ah. I mean, if I had kids, if kids were in the picture, it would be doubly. Okay. I mean, triply difficult (laughs) now that I have a kid. Well, let's talk about that. What is it like now that you have this blessing, this addition to your life? Wonderful blessing. Well, here's the thing. That story kind of falls in. It all weaves together because I decided to make my husband and I like we agonized over our first hire. Is it going to be an intern? You know this, Cynthia. Am Mm -hmm. I going to hire an intern, an assistant, (laughs) uh, a number two? Can I afford to pay them? It's their livelihood now, not just mine. (laughs) Mm. So we agonized over hiring. We hired someone in May of 2017. Okay. And we hired an intern and a full-time staff member. Oh, so you decided to do both. Right. But, you know, intern, <laughs> intern, wait, we did both, which was so scary. And then it was like, we hired and boom, pressed the gas. It was it like- It changed the dynamic it, of your business. And we doubled our revenue that year. Because you had help. Because I finally had help. To well, invest talk, talk about those dynamics though, right? So what did the person you hire replace for you yeah. that allowed you to double your revenue? Well, I hired somebody who was just like me. And that was an wow. that was advice that was actually given to me by Lori Turner Wilson over at Red Rover. Yeah, Shout downtown. out to Lori. Shout Turner out to Lori. Wilson. She was a, a really good mentor of mine. Um, so was Eric Matthews over at Start Co. Yeah, uh, both of them played significant roles in guiding me and helping me figure out what was next. Eric right. first said, "Like, how are you different than everyone else?" And I went, yeah. "I haven't thought about that." And I had to really think about what differentiates you from all the others in the market. Absolutely. And then Lori said her first hire was someone just like her. Now, your second hire shouldn't be just like you and your third hire should be totally different than you because you don't grow and your you don't your grow. business doesn't exactly. get better with hiring more of you. Like we don't need more of me in the world. I love that. But I hired someone who was just like me yeah. in the sense that she had a passion and love of people, which yeah. I do, and she loves storytelling. Mm. She wasn't like the most talented videographer or any of that. But what what has developed is she's become our client manager, director Mm. of client management. Amazing. And we now have a creative director. But the thing is, I hired her in 2017 and had no idea that in May of 2018, my husband and I would get a call Mm -hmm. about the baby boy we adopted. Wow. And we would have less than 24 hours to get to him. Whoa. And then we would be stuck in California for 27 days. No way. (laughs) So Julie, the girl I hired... In May of 2017, yeah. ran the company while we were gone. Wow. I mean, I was like in and out, wow. and I was more more plugged in than most new moms, because yeah. I'm like, this is also my baby. <laughs> <laughs> I got a baby, and I got a baby. Parent of two. <laughs> right. Parent of two. Now like six with all my employees. But right. the thing is, um, I didn't realize that I was setting myself up and setting her up to yep. be successful yep. until I was forced to step away. And so often as entrepreneurs, when we have our identity in all that we do and we have passion for it and all that, it's really hard to think about it running without us. Nothing is more humbling than (laughs) stepping away from Forever Ready Productions. Uh, Lauren Reedy bounces for 27 days to like, you know, start her family and Mm -hmm. stuff. And um, it forced Julie to really come into her own. And now I feel like I can step away for vacation and, and the business runs. You know, it used to be when Lauren went on vacation, Forever Ready shut it shuts down. down. And, and that hinders and your business. It so hinders. July, <laughs> June and July were always slow for us yeah. Yeah. until I had a staff. And, and it, I didn't know at the time that that's what I was doing was setting myself up for this ability to step away. Yeah. But um, taking those risks and they were calculated risks. It wasn't yeah. like I just like frivolously said, hi, you're hired and I'm going to pay you a ton of money. Right. Uh, that was not the case. I said, I see a lot of potential in you and I want to develop you and I'd love you to be a part of our growth. Yeah. And um, everybody that I brought on staff has has bought into that and now yeah. we collectively grow together and it's it's just incredible to see you know, you look back and you're like, that's not what I would have planned. Yeah. And you have no. a company culture now. That's really exactly. cool. And, and we all lift each other up. So that was the story of the calculation. But what was the actual calculation, right? right? I'm glad you asked that. You're listening to Grind Set right here on the Kazookian Network. The Chairman's Perspective. Hi, this is Lee Eric Smith. Let's take a look inside Shelby County government as we unleash some of the views of our very own Chairman of the Shelby County Commission, Van Turner. The Chairman's Perspective on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Kazookian.com, or your favorite podcast provider. The Chairman's Perspective on the Kazookian Network. Kazookian! Hi, I'm Lauren Reedy, owner of Forever Ready Productions. If you want to hear impactful and exciting podcasts like The Chairman's Perspective, Grindset, Funky Politics, or Best in Blue, make sure you download the Kazookian app on Google Play or your app store. Welcome back to Grindset. Um, Before the break, Lauren was talking about 
hiring and employees. And she talked about the type of people she hired in, in that particular calculation. But there's also financial calculations and considerations to hire employees. What were yours? At the beginning, it was how much can we <laughs> spend without, you know, going broke. But also, I have to note something I think is really important in mm-hmm. my story that a lot of people miss. Um, and I actually don't like to emphasize it because no offense to the men in the room, but oftentimes men get credit for women's work in a women-owned business situation. Right. And right. I, I've, I've had a lot of situations where people have looked past me to my husband and he's been oh, like, wow, she's the creative one. She's the lead. <laughs> I, I just make sure you pay me. But, um, you know, we had Scott's corporate job yeah. and benefits right. to fall back on. And so I, it allowed me to take some risks that mm-hmm. not everybody can take. Okay. So I need people to know that. But when we were talking about hiring, it was looking ahead and projecting what we had, but we saved a lot. Okay. We'd, I didn't pay myself hardly anything the first year. I mean, if you look back at the books, it's because we had Scott's salary. Yeah. Okay. I saved a lot of money. And you could live off one income. I, we could live off one income. Okay. And I, I had student loans. So basically, that's all I paid myself was my student <laughs> loan debt, which okay. is funny because it's my education is yeah. what got me here. Right. But... Um, when we made those decisions, everybody made the same when we first started, myself included. And I'm the founder, yeah. right? right. But you just got to set aside your ego. Do you want to grow do. or do you, you do. want you to want... make a ton of money? Because yeah. those two things don't go hand in hand. Not always. Not always. Sometimes <laughs> they do if you get the perfect something. But at the v- very beginning, yeah. I, and I shared this with my employees, I said, I'm paying you the same, I'm paying me. Okay. And when we grow, we all get more raises and <laughs> yeah. all mm-hmm. those things. So they very much understood that. So our base salary was a, a livable wage, more than a livable wage, yeah. I should say. It was definitely we weren't like, you know, you're you're in here for 25,000. That's just that's slumming it. Slumming it. Yeah. I made sure that I paid my employees yeah. a fair amount so that they could live well in Memphis. Okay. Um and then I gave them opportunities for bonus as we grow. And so everybody gets bonuses for the work that they nice do. Structure. It's not like um commission because I don't want people being like I did this really fast and not good. It's yeah. more profit it's, share. Yeah, it's 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 exactly what it is at the end of the year everybody gets a piece of the pie. Um, and so, like I said, the first year solo, we did six figures, doubled that revenue in the second year, tripled or doubled that revenue. So okay. that sounds like a hundred million. Already. <laughs> I wish, I wish. <laughs> you know, Double my husband is the, I would say my husband's the accountant. He's the so number of the guy. <laughs> I had to like talk to him. I, I'm very much aware of our financial standings, yeah. but I often have to have conversations like now explain that to me again. Yeah. But um, well, no, we're I, on I a path actually... of growth because of the decisions we've made and the risks that we've taken. But we also do it with these things in mind. We want to make sure that we're paying a fair, just wage and our employees feel like they can live. Right. We also have a goal to and had a goal to offer benefits. We now do that. Okay. We do health reimbursement and 401k. Woo. Woo, woo, woo. Congratulations. <laughs> that that major. was huge because my husband's a big like retirement savings guy yeah. 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 and the day we were able to offer that was huge for us and oh, ultimately wow. makes your company more uh, competitive exactly wow. exactly and then we offer unlimited vacation which sounds cray cray okay <laughs> unlimited it feels a little cray cray when yeah. people are off at the same time but what i find is that people take good quality time off yeah and it allows them to be more creative when they're back in the office. I love that. Uh, so you're listening to Grind Set Powered by the Kazookian Network. Um, I'm loving the growth. I'm loving the numbers. You're doubling. You're tripling. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the challenges, right? Yes. Plenty. You, you, <laughs> plenty. All right. Let's <laughs> How just, long do we have? Let's just those? jump right in. As a business owner, um, you know, obviously you had uh, experience in, in the media industry, but what were just some of the fundamental challenges as a, a business owner coming out the gate for you? Biggest challenge for me has been that my passion is storytelling and shooting video. It's not running a business. Yeah. Ah. Um, but I also have a passion of empowering people, which I d- am discovering. I didn't realize like that that's what I enjoy doing. Okay. But managing people mm. ah. is hard okay. and takes time. And it takes you away from the things that you used to do, okay. that you hired. Fun fact, you hired the people you hired to do for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I hire people to shoot and edit. I still do it because I can't step away. I love it too much. Yeah. Yeah. But they do more of that. The challenge in that is making sure that they're meeting your expectations, or I should say exceeding them, because okay. I don't want somebody who's just meeting my expectations. Yeah, right. But creating a culture that inspires them. Um, I have had to fire. Wow. And the first time I made uh, a decision to let someone go was, it, it was, I think somebody recently told me it's like cutting off a limb. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I know. The, the, see it. Your baby. It's, it's yeah. painful, right? Yeah. Because. Because when I hire someone and I bring them into our company and our culture, I believe in them and I want them to succeed and I want them to grow and I want them to, to discover things about themselves that lead them to whatever is next. Right. If next is staying with me and growing and you know becoming a partner and all those things, 
awesome. I hope that happens. Yeah. Yeah. If next is going on to your th- next thing, but what you learned with us and in Memphis and the experiences you had, awesome. Right. So when you get someone in that's just not necessarily the best fit for the culture of your company or isn't meeting your expectations and you want, you try so hard, yeah. it's really hard to look them in the eye and say, I don't think this is a good fit. Yeah. And okay. that was that was agonizing for me. Wow. And now we, we didn't just cut ties and say bye. Yeah. Um, you know, we were very generous with, with that. Okay. But I learned a lot of lessons yeah. because mm-hmm. what I didn't do a good job of was before I brought them in, deciding the kind of person that fit our culture. Mm. Ah, okay. Which okay. is hard because you, you're you so excited to grow Yeah. and you want to make sure that you're, um, you've already hired somebody who's like you so you don't need any more people like you. <laughs> Got that Truthfully, you need to get some diversity up in here. Yeah. You don't need a bunch of Laurens in that. <laughs> so, so hiring people that are different than you that come from different backgrounds. Right. But the key thing that I learned is that they've got to be hungry for the same things you are or ah, hungry for something. Right. If they don't have any passion in our culture mm-hmm. and they just come to work because it's a job yeah. you're not going to do well right you're just not because i'm not going to tell you to be here at eight and leave at five or <laughs> six or whatever time normal people yeah. leave i don't know <laughs> i don't know either <laughs> but the, it was i've learned a lot of lessons about culture and making sure people are here for the right reasons and so now we do some things in our interview process yep. okay. we ask some interesting questions like if you could work on anything no limits what would you and that reveals uh, a lot okay. when was the last time that you volunteered not in a judgmental way but sure. i want to hear where you have a Your heart experiences yeah i want to hear what you did even if it was five years ago tell me about it because i'm curious <laughs> yeah. yeah um and we've we've asked we ask more questions to figure out whether or not people have humility I know that's hard to judge in an interview because everyone puts on... I like how you interview, though. This is cool. Everyone puts on their best face, but you got to be humble where we work because it's a... Our um, core values are service, collaboration, creativity, and efficiency. I saw those on the website. Nice website, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, Our collaboration is is huge. Mm -hmm. So everything that we do one to one to five of us have touched in some way. Okay. Whether we've shot it or edited it or, you know, produced it or directed it. And it's really important that you're cool with that. Right. If you want all the credit, you're not gonna work well not with the us, right company. Right? For you. Right. We just I mean, it's everybody's and yeah. now I will totally give credit where credit's due, but I've learned a lot of lessons in that. I've also learned that um being the boss doesn't mean that you have to be liked. Or Ooh. best or besties with everybody, which is so hard when you're small. Like we're family, right? Yeah. And they are family to me. Mm-hmm. My employees are like family. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean they have to love everything I say and doesn't mean we have to hang out on the weekends <laughs> and you know, we might do team building happy hour or something, but right. um, those things are important. And then client management. Yeah. You know, some clients are like, I love everything you do. I want no changes. <laughs> this is amazing. And I'm like, can I record that and play it back 85 times? Yeah. <laughs> and some clients, it's like you're speaking a different language yeah. Yeah. and you give them something that you worked really hard on and they hate it. Because yeah. it's creative and a creative process is interpreted differently. And so understanding that it doesn't really matter what we think. It's right. a, it w- it's what the client thinks. And we need to do whatever that takes. And that's been hard for me to accept. Mm-hmm. But it's been really hard to teach my employees to accept. Yeah. Because it's their, it's their baby too. Right. Um, those lessons of, you know, just because I, I think that the way I'm doing it works doesn't mean that it works. And then the other challenge that I think a lot of women founders have, mm-hmm. but I know men do as well. Okay imposter syndrome right you walk ah. in and you're like i'm doing this and i and i i think i know what i'm doing right. i mean i do know what i'm doing do i know what i'm doing oh my gosh i don't know what i'm doing they're gonna figure it out and you're, you just start spiraling right into this uh i i'm not good enough i can't do this oh my gosh kind of thing right. and and you're constantly having to tell yourself no you're here for a reason mm-hmm. you've grown for a reason you work with the people you work with for a reason yes and, um, you know, snap out of it. But that is a huge challenge. Okay. Being a, a woman in a video production. Yeah. It's a male dominated industry. Interesting. And I can talk story all day, but you want to talk <laughs> technical. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know, ask my creative director, <laughs> you know, and just because I don't know how to speak camera cards to you doesn't right. mean I don't know what I'm doing. Right. right. But oftentimes that's how people get their cred is they say, you know, whoa, what, what frequency do these microphones use? And right. I'm like, I don't know. Do they work? <laughs> <laughs> do they sound good? Yeah. Great. Let's use them. Yeah. And so just making sure that you speak confidently about what you do yes. um, instead of giving in to some of those things that present challenges of your ability to do your job. Okay. Questioning you're, that is hard. You're listening to Grind Set. Powered by the Kazuki Network. Don't be an imposter. Yes. Um, and we'll be right back after the break. 
r and on Sports is proud to be on Sirius XM. So what's r and stand for? Real talk and relevant sports issues. It's racial and relative. We're brothers from the South. We can relate. r and on Sports on the Katsukian Network. Welcome back to Grind Set. We're here with Lauren Reedy of Forever Ready Productions. And we're, we're just talking about just the business, right, of production and the journey. But one of the things you touched on in the last segment was the fact that you still look at your numbers. Like you don't do them and maybe you don't understand them always, but they're being explained to you so you can start to understand the language of your business. Talk to us more about that. Yeah, I think it's really important to understand it because it also helps you reach goals if you set financial goals or revenue goals or things like that. If you understand how many units of something you need to bring in to reach the thing you set or the goal you set, then you can keep track of it easier. But for me, it's also, it's empowering. I'm a, I've never been tested dyslexic. I joked yeah. earlier, but I really <laughs> feel like I'm dyslexic. I have those moments. I had a heck of a time saying the name of this network because there's a Z and a K and Oof. I flip them around. And it, seriously, it happens. Yeah. So for me, numbers like make my head spin, Okay, um, which is funny because I was a journalist. <laughs> I always had that double, triple, quadruple check. And so getting to know the finances has been really important to me. We have a yeah. dashboard. I log into it maybe once a week and I get an idea of where we're at revenue wise, mm-hmm. where we're at, who owes us what. I always check in with my husband, who's not an accountant by day. He's an yeah. IT guy, but he's a numbers guy. And yeah. so he does right now at the level we're at, he does our accounting. That is something we would probably want to hire out. Okay. We pay him 10 uh, hours a week okay. at an entry level accountant <laughs> hourly rate. <laughs> That's fair. So that we can budget for it. Right. Um, I, we know that at some point, either he'll need to quit his job and do this full time or we'll need to, to give that to a professional. Yeah. But it's important to know what's going on in your business. So you have an idea how to get where you want to go. Now, now, five years in, I do want to talk about the professionals that you've utilized so far. Do you have attorneys that you use, bankers, outside accountants, et cetera? What, what professionals are you using in your business right now? We have an outside, um, not an accountant, an outside attorney. Yep. Um, we work with Baker Donaldson. Okay. Um, we oh, built yeah. a great relationship with them because of the startup connection. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, Emily um, Brackstone is our lawyer. Well, she's not anymore. She's like a partner over there. So she, (laughs) somebody else does it, but we contact Emily. Yeah. Yeah. She helps us work through legal contracts and things like that. Um, And then we're always looking to build relationships, but we recently changed our bank because of a relationship we built with our client. We we work with Orion now. Okay. Okay. Um, We, but my husband likes to do have two places with where we put our money (laughs) Okay. because he he likes to have the relationships and the longevity and all those things. And so when we first started, we went with an, a big corporate bank because the minimum for a business account was lower. And that is something that's difficult. I've done that my phone. You know, it's I'd... like, well, I'm going to start with a place that'll take the least amount of money because I don't have any. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, as you grow, you start building relationships. And so we switched over because we built a relationship and we believe in the fact that they're giving back to the community in right. very large ways. Right. Um, and that's and you can deposit online. Yeah. Fun fact. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> millennial. Yeah. Uh, but building those relationships. I've also joined a Vistage group. Uh, if you're familiar, a Vistage is a, um, it's a group. It's like having a board of directors that doesn't invest in your company. Hmm. You pay to be a part of it. It comes with a business coach. And it allows me once a month to sit around a boardroom table with a bunch of small business owners at various levels of revenue. Okay. Um, you know, six figures all the way up to millions yes. in wow. the same room with, with a lot of different experience. And what you find is that you have a network of people who all go through the same things no matter where they are in their wow. business journey. Yeah. Uh, and that's been tremendously valuable because it's gotten me a financial advisor, yep. which is really helpful. And that's why we made 401k something that was we valued in our company. That's okay. amazing. Um, it's gotten us uh, looking at IT services, even though Scott does that for a living. <laughs> and it's making us have bigger conversations about building relationships outside of just direct clients that we work with, but people who are also building their businesses right. and, and becoming clients of theirs. So tremendously valuable. Well, I love that you shared that information because I really wanted to know kind of what are the next steps for Forever Ready Productions? Like, where do you see your company growing in the next five to 10 years? I love that you asked that. We ha- I usually have an answer for it because we do strategic planning once a quarter. Oh, nice. And we have this thing called a big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, <laughs> I, I don't like that term, but it's called a BHAG. Okay. Uh, and it's very, it's pretty vague, but we want to become the production company for nonprofits, small businesses, and startups. Okay. And I didn't say, I didn't specify where. You we, did. I like that yeah. you, you left it open. We just want to be the 
production company for those folks. Because there are big production houses that do, you know, Hollywood films and, and really expensive Super Bowl commercials. Yes. And there are freelancers that do great work too. And we want to be somewhere in the middle capturing that audience. But for us, I want to expand. I want to expand to places where we have roots. We're from the Midwest. So we'd love to do something maybe in Chicago or Iowa. Cool. Mm-hmm. Keeping our roots here in Memphis, keeping right. our home base here, but opening up sort of satellite offices. And to me, I would love to grow in a way that continues to empower um, my employees. So they have the opportunity to work on passion projects and spend time giving back to their communities, but more importantly, learning and getting a worldview of what things are like outside of their norms. And so as we grow, we sort of think about that. We've got people in place. Um, we've started conversations with folks in other cities mm-hmm. about, you Very know, come nice. to Memphis, learn what we do, yeah. go do it somewhere else. Um, but as we grow, I, I think we'll have a couple of offices in different places, which is really exciting and very scary. <laughs> that is big, hairy, and audacious. Right, right. <laughs> I absolutely love it. And look, before we close, we've been talking so much about your brand and your company. Can you tell us how to get more information about Forever Ready Productions and, you know, how can that nonprofit that's looking to tell their story get in contact with you guys? So the fastest way to do it if you're on Facebook is to go to Forever Ready Productions on Facebook. We're constantly posting probably daily some of the work that we do. We okay. reshare our clients work and post some original content you can also find sort of a um a portfolio of things that we've done on forever ready llc.com okay if you're on instagram forever ready pro nice. is our handle um and we do that's or forever ready llc excuse me is our handle llc yeah. that's important mm-hmm. you know when i started the business all these you had to like Please match them, but some are taken. <laughs> yeah. um, and we, we post on our Instagram pretty regularly. Lots of behind the scenes stuff. Okay. Um, and then you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. Just look up Lauren Reedy. Oh, my you're my Reedy. handle, yeah, my handle on Instagram is actually my AOL screen name. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll tell you like Shout how old I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> AOL screen name. PWR blonde. Love it's like it. the power yeah. button, blonde. Because I'm a powerful blonde. Um, I love it's just, it. It stuck with me. My dad recommended it to <laughs> yeah. me in like fifth grade. He's like, how about power blonde? And <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's my handle now. I'm not changing it. I've no had way. it for I all love these it. years. So. Now, how are you managing all these social medias, right? <laughs> There's a lot of different pages. and Constantly like, iterating. Honestly, um, some days I'm on top of it. And some yeah. days I'm like posting from bed. Uh, <laughs> because I'm like, oh, I forgot to post today. Yeah. And that's something as we grow too thinking outside of just the core of what we do. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you understand this too, Cynthia, the core of what you do, you might need somebody who just does social media or I have just hired, does client management. Yeah, I have eight brands now and I had to hire somebody uh, last year to manage it because I was losing precious time trying to post right. every day on every uh, right. platform. It's and that's crazy. one of our, our goals in the next 12 months is to get someone in our on our team that that really specializes in that and then yeah. can also offer consulting to our clients because they often ask, now that you made me the video, what do I do? <laughs> but I, I am always on social media. So yeah. it's it, it's from my news days. Like yeah. we had to be. Yeah. And so it, it comes very natural to me, but sometimes it feels like a chore. <laughs> Lauren, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank it's you for having me. Great. It's, it's been, been a amazing. great show. <laughs> it's been fun. Yeah. We should do this again sometime. <laughs> we should. Same time next week. <laughs> Same time next week. <laughs> Lauren really lived up to my expectations and she was great at sharing her story and especially her why. And during the conversation, I just pulled out a lot of major keys, even though I didn't highlight them during the show. The first one was start where you are. The second one is take advantage of mentorship. She has mentors and she has a Vistage group. The third one is imagine your business without you, and that should inform your hiring decisions and most importantly, allow you to take vacations so that you don't burn out. Also, you don't have to be liked as the boss. You just have to be effective and efficient in managing your people. And lastly, know your numbers. Uh, Maybe it's through strategic planning. Maybe it's having conversations with your accountant. Maybe it's making looking at your numbers on a weekly basis, but know the numbers of your business and the story that it's telling. Cynthia. And so for me, uh, again, this was a very powerful interview and I was really inspired um, with this quote for the week. Doubt is a killer. You just have to know who you are and what you stand for. And that's from Jennifer Lopez. And listening to Lauren's story, she never doubted herself and her business and her ability. She just jumped right in and look at how successful she is now. She was definitely forever ready doing this interview. Absolutely. You've been listening to Grind Set, powered by the Kazookian Network, and we'll see you next episode. Grind Set.
Executive producer, Epicenter. Grind set is directed, produced, and distributed by Kazukian. 